Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Uh, we start the uh, video four on the five zero nine zero O level biology chapter ecology, and this has got to cover up the portion of pollution which is left, which is air pollution and pollution due to insecticides, and then we're going to discuss conservation and recycling. So this video has uh, going to be covering the topics left from the last three videos and it's uh, pollution conservation and recycling now as we look at air pollution we discuss the greenhouse gases but in air pollution there is also another component which is uh, air pollution by acidic gases sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen contributing to acid rain now this acid rain is basically due to sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen which will form sulfuric acid and nitric acid and that of course results in immense damage number one damage to buildings number two there's leaf damage and if there is leaf damage there's going to be less crop yield so all these factors are going to result in uh, sulfur dioxide and oxides of nitrogen dissolving in the water in the air and uh, forming acid rain how acid rain forms? Acid rain is caused by a chemical reaction that begins when compounds like sulfur dioxide and nitrogen oxides are released into the air. And that's when you burn coal and you burn uh, wood. These substances can rise very high into the atmosphere where they mix and react with water, oxygen and other chemicals to form more acidic pollutants known as acid rain. Another explanation uh, to acid rain, normal rain water is always slightly acidic because carbon dioxide present in the atmosphere gets dissolved in it and forms carbonic acid. So normal acidity of rain water is 5.6 and you can see the reaction water, carbon dioxide, H2CO3. Because of SO2 and NO2 gases as pollutants in the atmosphere, the pH of rain is further low to as 2.4 and this type of precipitation is called acid rain. So acid rain is a combination of H2SO4, HNO3 and HCl is the third. So acids contributing to acid rain. Effects on buildings causes extensive damage to buildings, structural materials of marble, limestone, slate. Uh, in Greece and Italy, invaluable stone statues have been partially dissolved by acid rain. The Taj Mahal in Agra is also suffering due to acid fumes from the Mathura refinery. So all these effects are on the buildings. Then how the acid rain can also cause lake acidification. A lake is a freshwater ecosystem. Sulfur dioxide reacts oxygen water to produce sulfuric acid. And this of course is deposited as acid rain. And this will result in uh, lake acidification. Then we come to the topic of uh, pollution due to insecticides. You know, insecticides are sprayed on the crops uh, to kill the insects which might be eating the leaves like caterpillars. And if they eat up the leaves, then the leaves surface area decreases, so less photosynthesis. Less photosynthesis means less fruit, means less seeds or means less flowers. So less crop yields. Now, these insecticides might be sprayed uh, onto the crops, but then they're washed into lakes and rivers, and here they form a very dilute solution in the water. But as the fish consume it, the smaller fish consume it, and then the larger fish, and then even the larger fish, so it increases in the bodies of these fish, because if these chemicals are not biodegradable, then they will accumulate, and this is called biomagnification. And the finally, it will harm the final consumer. And if humans are the final consumer, then we're going to be affected by it. Or the top carnivore, as we say. So, pollution due to insecticides is not a very interesting and not a very good thing for the environment and for the aquatic and the marine life. And generally, talking about pesticides, you know, pesticides could be anything, could be... Uh, herbicides or could be an insecticide but these have contribute to a lot of air pollution as well because when this drift the pesticide drift the chemical drifts occurs when pesticides suspended in the air as particles are carried by wind to other areas weather conditions at the time of application as well as temperature and relative humidity change the spread of the pesticide in the air so another very very bad harmful effect is the pesticide drift 
this is of course a very very interesting article on this is that the hazards of pesticides the pesticide industries cause pollution of soil water and air the pesticide the chemical residue washed along with rain water is added to the nearby water resources making it unfit for drinking and you know if people are drinking water from that lake or that pond well they don't even know they're taking in all that chemical they enter the food chain and cause problems by bioaccumulation and biomagnification they are not target specific and also kills non pest insects it adversely affects the mechanism of entomophily continuous and indiscriminate use of pesticides may develop resistance in insect pests like super pests and super bugs now i just use this word entomophily here and i thought i need to explain this to you what is entomophily entomophily is pollination through the insects and flower is called an entomophilus flower so rose jasmine bougainvillea lotus sunflower and the common visiting insects are bees butterflies moths wasps and drones so what is an entomophilus flower the one which is insect pollinated now another word which i have used uh, in a previous uh, in a minute or two ago is biomagnification now what is biomagnification is also known as bio amplification or biological magnification is the increasing concentration of a substance such as a toxic chemical in the tissues of tolerant organisms at successively higher levels in a food chain now another very good diagram showing you this you can see here now in the water there was only 2 parts per million then as it's gone into the plankton it's 5 parts per million and in the fish it's 200 parts per million ppm is parts per million and then in the bird it's 1600 parts per million now as you can see here the very good explanation of it is biological magnification refers to a process where toxic substances move up the food chain and become more concentrated at each level these substances are often pollutants from industries or pesticides from farming and we were talking about insecticides a little while ago an example of biological magnification and its dangers is any small fish that eats plankton that has been tainted with mercury hundreds of small fish might then contain just a few parts of the mercury not enough to cause major harm on the image the amount of mercury is measured in parts per million per million parts per million a bird then might eat hundreds of the small fish so that now instead of 200 parts per million in a single fish that bird has much higher levels of mercury the toxin amplifies as it moves up the food chain biological magnification caused a crisis with eagles where ddt was used to control mosquitoes and other pests ddt was a chemical which we used for many many years now it's been stopped birds would accumulate toxic levels of ddt in their bodies which would cause their eggs to become fragile and break the eagle almost became extinct but law makers banned ddt and the then the eagle is now in recovery So this is a very good picture showing you biological magnification. Now we come to the discussion of uh, reasons for the conservation of species, and this is the uh, point M of the syllabus. And coming to discussions of this, is we have to talk it in three contexts. Number one is maintenance of biodiversity. Why do we have to maintain biodiversity? Why are we so worried that uh, this and this animal is becoming extinct? The main reason is that all food chains are interdependent. So all food chains are interdependent. If a certain plant dies, then all the primary consumers which were dependent on that plant will also die. So just like you know, pandas only eat bamboo shoots. So if all the bamboo shoots were finished, then all the pandas would also die. They don't eat anything else. You see, animals are very, very uh, picky about what they eat. It's not humans who can eat anything and everything, but you know, a certain animal would only eat like pandas would only eat bamboo shoots. So, maintenance of biodiversity. So, all food chains are interconnected. So, if we lose a certain plant, we'll we'll lose the primary consumer. If we lose the primary consumer, we will lose the secondary consumer. so it is important that we maintain biodiversity then the next thing is we come to the management of fisheries now fisheries are managed because you see we are doing overfishing 
so we are killing all the uh, we are reducing the populations and we are making a lot of fish extinct so what we do is we control the mesh size mesh size means the net size by which they do fishing so if the small fish can escape then of course these will breed next year and then we can maintain the populations and the last one is management of timber production timber production means is that we cutting down trees at a much higher rate than we are planting them so this is reducing this is resulting in deforestation so for every tree that we cut down we need to plant two trees because maybe one will survive one will not survive so management of timber production so planting trees cutting down trees yes we need them for maybe fuel or for uh, construction or something but then we also need to replant the trees and plant more trees so that if we cut them at a rate of more than what we are planting them, they take quite a while for the trees to grow. So management of timber production. Now when you look at the conservation of biodiversity, uh, it's a very nice, uh, this piece which I just figured this out. Scientists have identified more than 30 regions in the world as biodiversity hotspots. We should participate in conserving biodiversity. We should not disturb the native plants and animals so that they can live freely in their natural habitat. Native plants and animals, those which grow locally, we should not disturb them. Land fragmentation and deforestation is making several species homeless. Naturally, you know, trees are home for many birds and insects. The government makes laws to preserve biodiversity and create wildlife sanctuaries. Humans also need to take their responsibility for their actions and consciously stop polluting the environment. So maintaining biodiversity is a role in which we all need to play our uh, constructive role in it and try to voice the concerns if any such action is being taken in which some biodiversity is being lost. Now, how do we conserve fishing grounds? Now, number one, banning drift nets indiscriminately traps all forms of sea life. These are huge nets in which all types of uh, sea life are trapped and some of this is just thrown back and they're dead then. Then using nets with a certain mesh size so that young fish are not caught. Then regulating the size of ships allowed into fishing grounds. Then limiting the period of fishing in the fishing grounds then banning the harvesting of endangered species and then encouraging the raising of these fish in hatcheries and releasing them into fishing grounds where fish populations are decreasing. So this is how we can conserve our fish and the conservation of fishing grounds which can be uh, quite, a, quite a constructive biological venture. Then we come on to how people have developed conservation methods. Now, some people invented a TED, and it's very interesting, turtle excluder devices. And it allows fishermen to still catch the fish, but also if a turtle gets stuck, they can go through a little hole. So there are a few other conservation ideas and groups that are looking for donated money to get started. And these methods help to increase the population of the leatherback sea turtles, which will then help fisheries. So these are of course these devices on people work and try to uh, minimize the damage to the aquatic life by just in the fish being in, in the fishing nets many other animals being caught which are actually not sold and are not are not there for human consumption but they are caught in the nets and then they die because when you haul them and then throw them back into the water well they they are dead by that time. Now the last topic in the syllabus is discuss reasons for recycling materials with reference to named examples. Now whenever it says in the syllabus a named example, well you can do any example because they have not specified an example. So you could be doing something different in one school and maybe something else in another school because it depends upon uh, your biology teacher who teaches you anything. Now the like the one example that I like is that why do we cut down trees so that we get wood and then from the wood we make paper and you know the ma major consumption of paper is in uh, newspaper so if we can recycle that paper and then uh, not we can use it again and again and recycle it so then we will save a lot of uh, trees being cut down and this of course is of course very important for biology students 
because as we cut down trees to obtain the wood and then from the wood we make the paper so less uh, less paper used uh, li like we now developing a lot of paperless culture in which we do not print a lot of paper and we can just have things on our phones or on our uh, laptop so that we don't print a lot of paper so it's called a paperless culture which is now sort of evolving so less trees cut down would mean less effects of deforestation and less effects of deforestation mean less soil erosion and less climatic changes and uh, less loss of habitat for birds and insects. So you can be discussing any other example. I'm not saying you can't discuss any other example. You can, but this is the one which I find very favorable for uh, in the context of biology. So this is the reasons for recycling materials. Now we come to a point which we have missed out in another previous video is number the J part of the syllabus which says effects of humans on the ecosystem with emphasis on examples of international importance. This is the syllabus point effects of humans on the ecosystem with emphasis on examples of international importance. Now what have we done? We've done a lot of uh, uh, sort of harm to the environment by cutting down the tropical rainforest. Now you must remember the tropical rainforests are the highest biodiversity. They have a wide range of plants, they have a wide range of insects, they have a wide range of birds and what have we done is in order to construct buildings or construct roads or uh, construct factories we have been cutting these rainforests down and that is something which is not a very uh, not a very um, healthy thing to do because you are upsetting the whole biodiversity and you are maybe destroying trees which are found nowhere in the world except in the tropical rainforests. Then with the oceans what we are doing another further damage is we are having oil spills and we are throwing all the waste, um, household waste and sewage and all that we are throwing it into the oceans and we are polluting the oceans and of course we are affecting the marine life in that way. Then important rivers, you know rivers which flow through towns and cities like the Thames in London is highly polluted because people just throw everything and anything into it. So highly polluted rivers are going to then again there's going to be loss of biodiversity and these rivers will become polluted and will resulting in eutrophication and the death of all the uh, fish plus all the other uh, all the other organisms that live in the rivers. So this is the effect of humans on the ecosystem and these are the headings, the subheadings which you need to be looking up into. Uh, that finishes this chapter on ecology which is chapter 15 and uh, I hope you can do the questions on it and the MCQs and then you can revise it. Maybe you can go through this uh, video again and make your own notes and uh, best of luck. Thank you.